recording. Okay, awesome. And um, so uh, it's up to you whether you want to take questions uh, during your talk or you know after your talk. But uh, um, uh, people can okay. raise their hand in Zoom, and so if you want me, I can. If you want, I can point out to you when hands get raised. But yes, please. In fact, I, I do like interactions, uh, even though this also means adjusting. But I prefer interactions. Yeah, and. Uh, uh, I actually am having part of uh, extended uh, view so I can see people's facial expressions, especially the big demos and people puzzle, look, not look, shake their hand. All of these are very useful dem uh, reactions to, to me. I welcome them. Yeah. Okay, awesome. Okay, so I'll, I'll try to do that. And oh, Jeremy's here. Jeremy, oh, hi, Jeremy. nice to see you. Hi. hi. Hello, hello. Nice to see you. You're in York University now, Jeremy. I wish. <laughs> I am on the York uh, email list because uh -huh. my son, Ben, just uh -huh. moved to University of Toronto at Mississauga. Uh -huh. And uh, one thing led to another. And so I got myself on the York list. How's that for oh, nice. <laughs> some sort of a story? Yeah. yeah. And, and, you know, of course, you want to be close to your son, Jeremy. So anytime you want to move up, join us, let us know. Well, I, uh, I, Jeremy. Jeff, are you up there at this point? No, I'm, I'm still in Nashville, but I, I'm employed at York. I'm a, I'm, do we say Yorkie? I don't know. I, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds like a small dog, so I'm not sure that's the best thing. Okay. okay. All right. So my, my real question about York has been, what is the relationship of Jacob Beck to Jake Beck? Oh, uh, yeah, they must be. I think they're the same person. I don't think <laughs> it's a uh, it's a homonym that occasionally makes my uh, research statistics look much better than they are. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, he was okay. a great old homonym. <laughs> Okay, well, um, so I was going to say hi, Jeremy. Hi, everyone. Oh, hi, uh, you. Only five more days till he's gone. Well, out of office. God, we hope so. <laughs> yeah, let's hope we just have to get through these five days. Um, okay, well, I think people will begin and will continue to, um, to drop in, but we've already got a, a, a great audience. So um, I think we should get going. And um, thank you everybody for joining us. So it just uh, really delighted uh, that Zhao Ping has agreed to kick off our winter seminar series. Um, and we, we do have a great lineup um, uh, for you. I'll be sending out more details shortly, but of course next week we have Christoph Koch uh, as well. So that promises to be very interesting. Um, so, uh, you know, I'm, I'm sure most of you know Zhao Ping. Uh, I've certainly known her for years, uh, one of the leading computational neuroscience people in the world now uh, at the University of Tübingen and Max Planck. And I'll just provide a real brief uh, bio um, for her to give her most of the time, of course. Um, her background is originally in physics, um, and including a PhD in physics at Caltech. Um, she did a postdoc at the Fermilab um, in uh, Illinois and the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton, um, and then Rockefeller, um, and uh, was at Hong Kong University of Science and Technology. And then of course, um, was one of the original co-founding group at the Gatsby Neuroscience uh, Unit in London. Um, and uh, now since October 2018, so more than two years now, she's been at the University of Tübingen and uh, Max Planck. She's uh, head of the Department of Sensory and Sensory Motor Systems at uh, the Max Planck Institute for Biological Cybernetics, uh, which we all know and love. 
And uh, <clears throat> um, I'm afraid I don't know your work in high energy physics, uh, Xiaoping, um, but I, <laughs> I don't think I'd be able to understand it, even if you tried to explain it, but um, really diverse uh, career in a number of fields of science, but of course we all know her contributions to vision science um, in terms of, uh, uh, particularly in terms of uh, computational models of early visual processing um, and in particular saliency. And I think that's what we're gonna hear about um, today, the latest chapters in that, in that work. And so really looking forward to your presentation, Zhao Ping, I'll just hand it over to you now. Thank you very much for the kind of introduction. I'm uh, uh, where you invited me. I feel a little bit intimidated because the, you know, York Center for Vision Science has so many vision people. I said, mm, gosh, really very, very, very flattered, but also feel, you know, I, uh, I can uh, learn a lot and hear a lot of feedbacks and particularly criticism because today I like to share with you, despite being an I still like to share with you something that kind of uh, motivated from some theoretical thinking as well as past work to something new and lots of controversial things as well as uh, something brand new to VSS. So I like to uh, uh, hear your, uh, you know, feedback and soundboarding and do please stop me if you want to ask questions something unclear and I, as I said I'd love to see your facial expression like ah, I don't get it or, or, or nod and so I, I kind of helped me to pace me especially some of the demos and so on and so forth yeah so I'll continue this is just some artwork I did in the Christmas uh, and uh, but nevertheless I thought oh this is my first time to actually share it uh, so can I can I use one page to say what is uh, that are exciting me, yeah. So the idea is from VISH to CPD in a new framework for uh, understanding vision. And I said, hmm, why do we need a new framework? What, what, what's the current old framework and exactly what is VISH and what is new? And so VISH is visual uh, V1 saliency hypothesis and from which we motivate a central peripheral dichotomy. And so hopefully with this, we will then ask what exactly is vision? And if I want to study vision, I, you know, you, uh, you have uh, also your, your opinions, let's discuss, you know, uh, and uh, also for the new people, so do you want to join us, you know, in which framework and so on. And uh, so introduction, what is vision? The people you say, what do you mean, what is your vision? do we really understand vision? And usually you can think about, do we have a theory, like an evolution, you know, uh, some theory? And people say, okay, there is a theory by Horace Barlow, for instance, efficient coding hypothesis. But then people have to think about it before they think they realize the theory and this theory is very long time ago, you know, 1961. It's already kind of pointing out we don't understand. Otherwise the theory should be, of course we have a theory. What is it, you know, how vision works, yeah? And so let's say, what is the traditional framework? And the traditional framework, you know, what people know is a feature detector that starts with, you know, you just put something on the screen, see whatever fires up the neuron. And it started in 1953 with Steve Cooper for the center surround of the field, field and said, that's the feature we're detecting by retinal neuron, dots, okay? A white dot, black dot, red dot, dots. Wonderful. Now, two junior members in his group, Hugo Weasel carried the same framework feature detector next stage. And you all know that they found orientation selectivities, you know, vertical bar, horizontal bar, red bar, tilted bar, green bar, or even moving bars. So from dot to bars, that's quite a step forward. Yeah, first, or first one dot, two dot is a bar, three dot is a triangle, three dot is a curvature, whatever, or, you know, four dot square, and you can go to um, further up. That was more than half a century ago. So it's quite a long time ago, yeah. And, uh, but if you can just extrapolate from this and notice that Hugo and Weasel spent only 10 years to achieve that tremendous amount of work. And V1 is 25% of the whole visual system in our brain. So another 10 years, V2, another 10 years, V3, maybe, you know, after 15 years, you think we could have a complete understanding if you go along that framework. However, Somehow 50 years later, Hugo Weasel said that, you know, when they, when they were asked celebrating their 50 years anniversary of a wonderful achievement, you know, what's the next big question? They say, 
basically more or less that we haven't done much beyond the big one. I, I, I think it's a bit harsh. However, they do point out a, a problem for us and you may wonder what's happening. You know, what is vision? Are we asking the wrong question? And of course you can ask a different question rather than feature detectors. You say, how about let's think about vision as low level vision, mid level vision and high level vision. Yeah, and hmm, is this a good way, another way of thinking about it? What's wrong with that? First of all, it's not falsifiable. You can never say that's wrong. Okay, and theoretically that just, because it's not precise enough to guide us, nor is it precise enough to say it's wrong. So somebody else comes in to make him say, say yeah, say something concrete. You, now you can say he's right or wrong. And that's 40 years ago, almost 40 years ago. Yeah. Now, if he will be successful, that new framework, now you can say, David, Ma, is it really 3D model we're representing or two and a half D sketch? You know, he really put himself on the spot. And we know that if that will be successful, Hugo Weasel wouldn't be criticizing us 30 years later. So what is the problem? And in my opinion, I think it's because there's an elephant in a room we are ignoring, uh, at least for the framework I'm talking about so far, in terms of the feature detectors, David Mass three levels, and uh, uh, so, uh, three stages and so on, is the attentional bottleneck. So we already know by now, in fact, attentional bottleneck is not new, you know, it's, it's demonstrated, and somehow the enter into the vision framework, you know, is limited. Yeah, so we all know that these two images, if you see it for the first time, you couldn't tell the difference. We're change blind, we, are, we don't know. And in, even though, in fact, it's a huge difference in terms of whether the airplane engine present or absent. So it shows that we do have a bottleneck. We are blind to almost everything. And therefore, Perhaps we're asking wrong question. We need a new framework to acknowledge this elephant in the room. And that's the motivation. And so that we can make progress and rather than having B1 as the persistent frontier of our vision research. And so therefore the new framework is motivated by having this elephant in the middle of it and right at the center stage. So the idea is you have visual input comes in, massive input comes in and then immediately hit this attention of selection and bottleneck so that you only have, you know, less than 1% of that massive input is squeezed into this tiny network, uh, sorry, tiny bottleneck. And so it, it becomes like 40 bits per second. Actually, this number people often ask me where it's coming from. It's experimentally measured number more than half a century ago. It's repeated by multiple labs. And uh, so therefore we are more or less blind 99% blind of the data which you can look at the attentional change blindness roughly order of magnitude, not, not, uh, not too bad. And what if this bottleneck starts right at B1? Okay, this might explain why something suddenly changed that Hubel Weasel could do it so successfully to understand the feature detectors in B1, while later on researchers could not do it because if information were not passed down from V1 downstream, then it would be very difficult for you to measure receptive field. Yeah. So receptive field is measured by presenting something on a screen while you measure from a neuron and show whatever the feature on the screen that can excite this neuron. But if this information is not squeezed through the bottleneck, it will be difficult. Yeah. Of course, just because that makes sense doesn't mean this framework is right. So let me motivate a bit more. And another thing is, yeah. If the bottleneck starts right after V1, then it should make us ask a different question. What is V1, V2, VC3, 4 doing? Yeah, and, and so on. So if there's so little information goes on from V1 downstream, if you cannot see something, let's say I want to see an apple versus orange, is it apple versus orange? You may want to send top-down feedback back to V1 and say, hey, give me a bit more information, perhaps the color, okay? Orange should look orange and apple should look red or something like that. Because the bottleneck maybe did not send that particular critical information up, uh, 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 downstream. So that's more or less the uh, kind of a skeleton. So let me, Elaborate a little more. First of all, there's a big assumption. You say, hey, bottleneck starts at 
that V1 is output. You know, the whole thing, if this doesn't hold, it will not hold. And so that will be the first part of my talk to say, yes, there's lots of evidence. What is that a bottom that does start at V1? And if that's the case, how should we ask the new question that's the central peripheral dichotomy in the rest of the, the, the visual system? And you will also see that how much it makes me feel very ignorant about the visual system because, gee, my goodness, now what's the rest? Now it's like I'm very ignorant, you know, that, 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 that make, make us ponder and think. And so in this case, you know, you have this, let me elaborate. So the input comes in at about 20 images per second. We have a 1 million or more than 1 million photoreceptors at, at their signal to noise, you know, gradation and so forth. More or less, we have 20 megabytes per second of uncompressed, not wrong data, raw data coming in. And of course, you say, gee, it's not compressed. You can compress it. Yeah, 20 megabytes, about 20 books. So that's a lot. We cannot read it, 20 books. So you can compress it. This is Barlow's uh, efficient coding hypothesis. Then how much can you impress, uh, compress? And some of you are more expert than I do. You know, JPEG and MPEG, they can compress by, let's say, 10 to 100 times more. So indeed, by the, by the, well, when you exit the um, optic nerve, you have about one megabyte. That's still one book. You cannot read one book. How much can you read? Not even one page, perhaps two sentences. And that's indeed 40 bits per second, roughly like that. And so therefore, from the V1, you know, this one megabyte is going to V1, and somewhere down in the front will become 40 bits per second. And that's measured and it's repeated in multiple labs in 1950s. And it turns out that this bottleneck is also in the auditory bottleneck. You know, it's not just sensory V1 sense, it's also, I mean, visual sense, it's also auditory sense. And it's also the same bottleneck when you want to produce information. Let's say the, the speed you can speak, how fast can you, it's about the same. So therefore, this is a fundamental bottleneck. And in fact, 40 bits is not so little. It's like a 10 digit telephone number is about 40 bits content information. So one second having that, it's actually quite a lot. And how do we select? We select by eye movement. Yeah, I mean, we all know that. And so we look around three times a second and okay, 40 bits, two sentences, you know, a whole book. Okay, here's two sentences, that's David, that's Henry, that's, you know, you know, John and so on and so forth. So that's how we select about by eye movement. And once you select, you know, you first of all have to select, this is the two sentences I want to read without even knowing what two sentences is, then read it and you read it to say, oh, that's David, something like that. And so that's more or less the skeleton. And therefore to select really is to look by gaze shift. Okay, you select this where you want to, in a book you want to read these two sentences and then rest is seen. So therefore the framework is to recognize the big elephant in a room is looking and vision is looking and seeing and seeing is only in the context of looking, attentional selection. So am I talking too fast, too slow? Should I speed up? Oh yeah, do you think uh, James? Yeah. I think that's perfect so far, Shafi. Thank you, okay. And so then, you know, this is a no schematic because okay, I had the first look is here and it's a shoe and it's David and Henry and so on, just like that. And uh, looking is done by peripheral because before you shift gaze from the second fixation to the third fixation, the third fixation is in your peripheral visual field. Somehow your peripheral visual field, without knowing what these two sentences are, decide to read that and just then, then you gaze shift and put in your central visual field. So looking is peripheral visual tell, field tell you whether to look up, down, left, right. And then seeing is your central visual field, you read that and say, ha, that's David. And, uh, and then information going from one megabyte from V1, then slowly dropping down to 40 bits. That's an empirical question. Is it slowly dropping down, suddenly dropping down? Does it go from V1 from meg one megabyte to half a megabyte or 0 0.1 megabytes by the time V2? That we don't know. So these are all these ignorance immediately exposed to us. What is the visual system doing? Yeah. And so that could be the new experimental investigation. And so looking, now let's say focus on where in the brain focus on looking. So that's the V1 saliency hypothesis is one part of looking. So the idea is just a review of visual selection. Most of you, uh, you already know it in textbooks, but also uh, lots of you are more expert than I do. You know, we select, so for instance, top-down selection and bottom-up selection, okay? So for instance, 
uh, top down is task dependent. Imagine I have a task that you, you have to find a uniquely oriented bar, and that will make you select this uniquely oriented bar. So even though some of you may not see the airplay engine in this change blindness demonstration, all of you without me having to point out to you, you have seen the red bar in this picture. Somehow this red bar automatically make you look at it. Yeah, and so that's the bottom up selection. Top down selection, usually people will think about the frontal, somehow the bottom up selection, which somehow can override your top down task such that I make you look at it. And if you let me be the kind of a simple uh, approximation theorist, because if it's a zeros order approximation, since bottom up overrides top down, can we think about selection first as bottom up only? That's perhaps not so great for primates like humans, but maybe more applicable to fish and, and frog and so on. But anyway, let's try just play this theoretical game. Bottom up selection. If we just look at it, and uh, psychologically, this idea has been there for a long time that somehow the brain uh, takes the retina input and builds a saliency map, so the psychological black box. And then we go from psychology to neuroscience, say which brain area does that? And that has been already proposed previously, for instance, by Koch and Woolman and Eugene Koch. They think it's higher brain areas such as parietal and frontal. And that's not unreasonable because there's good motivation for it. One of the motivation is anything can be salient, whether it is like orientation being unique or color being unique or uh, motion being unique. So therefore it's a gen general purpose thing. And therefore it should not be in a brain area where neurons are tuned to specific orientation, specific color. So you should have a map of the visual field, but no feature tuning and that parietal and frontal are very good candidates for that. As you can imagine, I'm going to propose something different that B1 is doing that. And so the idea is here's my equation that this saliency map, which is a psychological behavioral quantity measurable is equal to a biological quantity, which is physiological quantity, the V1 firing rate in the corresponding retinotopic map. So the idea is somehow this vertical bar, which attracts your attention, is exciting a V1 neuron much more than the horizontal bar, which is not attracting attention. And you can see that V1, in fact, has a monotonic, a monosynaptic projection directly to the superior colliculus, which can read out this saliency map, supposed saliency map, to have a winner take all and guide your attention. This is a zombie-like way of guiding your attention where you don't have the top-down feedback, a uh, top-down guidance of attention, yeah? And indeed, at this location where a V1 neuron is firing a lot, in this case is for a vertical bar, in this case is for a red bar because many V1 neurons can occupy the same residual field location. So let's say this is, you know, John V1 neuron, that's Mary V1 neuron, that's, you know, David V1 neurons, they all occupy the same location. As long as you know whoever's firing most is that's why I say highest at each location represent the saliency map. So it's as if the neural activities as universal currencies to bid for visual selection, regardless you are tuned to this feature, that feature, this feature dimension, that feature dimension. And this is my metaphor that I use often to motivate seeing beyond the traditional box that why we do we need to go to a brain area there has a spatial map, but no feature tuning. We can uh, perfectly well do it in a visual area, it has a spatial map and feature tuning. If attention in the superior calculus is like an auction shop, which has a slogan that says, attention auction here, no discrimination between your feature preferences, only spikes come. And this auctioneer, superior calculus, say, hey, in fact, I'm feature blind anyway, and also super critics neurons, at least in monkeys, they are not as feature tuned, so therefore, but if they have a special map, they can read firing rate. So therefore, a V1 neuron tuned to red and come up paying three spikes of money versus another V1 neuron tuned to right world motion playing one spike of money versus another V1 neuron tuned two spike of money tuned to orientation. Whoever pays more gets it. And so imagine this neuron pays more and this neuron happened to be has reserved field there, then, 
the attention, which is the gaze shift, will be awarded to this highest bidder at this gaze uh, location. That's the metaphor to think B1 can do that. And therefore, if you know what now you think about gate, that's a theoretical motivation. What is the mechanism in V1 that does that? If somehow retina input comes in and V1, the mechanism in V1 is indeed whatever having part of the Hubert Weasel's findings. So here is about uh, three by three millimeters of a section of V1 where different patches are visualized by different colors to visualize their preferred orientation, vertical or horizontal. And superposed on it is a parameter cell stained such that cell body, notice it's in this blue patch, that means it's tuned to vertical and it's sending exon collaterals up to two or long more millimeters away. That means it's sending to neighboring hypercolons but it's preferentially also ending in these blue patches such as connecting to other neurons preferring vertical orientation. So vertical tuned cell in V1 and other vertical tuned cell in V1 nearby are talking to each other. And this most of talking is actually disynaptic inhibition, such that this is something actually have been observed physiologically and later on anatomical evidence coming out since 1970s, showing that V1's firing is actually uh, uh, influenced by surround. It's called isofeature surround suppression. That means if you are tuned to vertical, I'm tuned to vertical, you suppress each other. If you're tuned to vertical, I'm tuned to horizontal, that suppression is less. Okay, so therefore, if you're tuned to horizontal, I'm tuned to horizontal. These horizontal bars are suppressing each other, so their firing rate is less. And this only vertical bar does not have neighboring vertical bars or activating neighboring neurons. So that's the only one escaping suppression. That's why it has a high firing rate. So it's as, it's as simple as that. And so therefore, if you're recording from this neuron, this neuron is firing a lot, great. You keep your electrode to this neuron and you just turn the horizontal bars outside of the field to vertical. And suddenly the same neural recording fires less. This has been seen in this physiological work before, but it was treated like nuisance because, gee, what does that mean? Now this firing less is, you know, more than 50% times and up to 80%. So, some, so it's quite impressive. Um, you know, it could be also 20%, you know, how much less it's good, great, it depends on which neuron, you know, which, yeah. And of course, when we, if you weasel did it this way, it's only one bar in the blank screen, of course, and nobody's pressing. Again, the same neuron firing a lot. Well, what does that mean? The restrictive field idea is a little bit getting destroyed. That might be the reason why these old findings seem to be a bit nuisance for the old idea, yeah? Uh, so is it the restrictive field same neuron firing a lot? Firing less? Firing a lot. Salient? Not salient? Salient. So this is salient CMAP. Salient, not salient, salient. Yeah? So that's a salient CMAP. And you say, okay, what if now suddenly I have a cross? In V1, is it any neuron tuned to cross? No neuron tuned to cross. But this is salient. This cross attracts my attention. No matter, you can have additional neuron, one neuron to two horizontal comes in and fire a lot. So therefore, the saliency map doesn't have to be said, okay, why is face attracting attention? You know, my name attracting attention. It's possible it's beyond V1, that's the reason, but it's also possible that V1 is being responsible for that. So you don't need to be tuned to faces or whatever to make a feature of a face to attract attention. Let's say I put on a very strong contrast makeup to make my eye attract attention. You think it's some higher feature. It's possible V1 does it, yeah? And, and this, you can even do a simulation in a model neural network. And, uh, you know, you can put in more complicated inputs such as, uh, I think James are very familiar with it. Yeah, about contour integration. You have, you know, all these segments uh, activating V1 neurons. And then you find that higher output is actually on a smooth contour and the smooth things. And you can even put in a natural scene, filters to the Gaboras, the field, that's the input to V1. And then after all these lateral interactions, it comes into that. Okay, salient features highlighted and less salient features suppressed. And okay, any um, theoretical work, you know, whatever I, I told you so far is as if you are just post-mortem talking, explaining past data that seem to make sense. 
But one criteria for saying whether a theory makes sense is can you predict something that wasn't known before your theory? Okay, so let's, let's try that. We see that this is because iso-orientation suppression that make this unique oriented bar salient, firing more V1 neurons uh, in V1. And this is because V1 neurons like to like suppression is not only that you're tuned to the same orientation suppress each other, you can also say if I'm tuned to blue, you are also tuned to blue, you suppress each other. So therefore this red will also be attractive, uh, you will also excite more. And that's called isocolor suppression. Later it was, you know, for instance, found in Wackler et al, 2003. And you can also have isomotion direction suppression. Okay. And so all of these were available in V1. So that makes sense. So now let's try to say, can we predict something in we don't know? Okay. Can you think about other features, orientation, color, motion, any other feature that V1 will be tuned to? That you can say, I serve that feature suppression. There we go. So yeah. Disparity. Disparity, that's true. Disparity, V1 neurons are also tuned. Uh, V2 neurons are also tuned. V4 neurons are also tuned. So therefore, if disparity pops up, you cannot say, hmm, V1 is the culprit. Is there some other feature? Yeah. So the other feature is a surprising feature. That feature is actually invisible. So Jeremy Wolf, you have done in 1980s. Yeah. Look at I have origin feature and I have origin is diag diagnostic of V1 because V1 neurons, some of them are binocular, some of them are monocular, some of them tune to the left eye, some of them to the right eye, but by V2, all neurons or almost all neurons, by, for, you know, according to human weasel, it's all neurons, according to other people, say it's only 90% of neurons, they are binocular, so no longer have I have origin information. And so therefore, if you ask people to do visual search, you say, look for somebody in a unique in the uh, right eye among distractors in the left eye. People cannot find it. That's a very nice finding from Jeremy Wolf in the 1980s. So, however, V1 neuron tuned to that, they have eye suffixes suppression. So, neurons in the left eye tuned to the left eye, neurons to the left eye suppress each other. So imagine you give people this kind of input. You ask people to do a task, find unique or the bar, you give them stereo goggles, and they did not realize that in their right eye there's nothing, they can do this task very quickly, okay? They can press their button within half a second and say, here's the unique order bar. Now imagine you put one of the non-target bars into the right eye. Now, as far as the subject's concerned, it sees the same image, yeah? And two unique items. One is unique because unique orientation. The other is unique because unique eye of origin. This bar evoke higher responses because of ISO feature suppression. This bar also evoke higher responses. Nobody tuned to the right eye is suppressing it. So now you have two hotspots competing for eye movement, okay, bidding for attention. So if this is competing with, it's going to make it weaker. weaker. So the prediction is even though they are doing this top down task to be, you know, would it go there? Okay. And that's really a surprising prediction when I predicted it. it first of all, it took me a long time to predict because I just never thought it that way. It took a long, in retrospect, that's the first thing you should test. And second thing that, oh God, my, my theory is, is dead. This is impossible. And I feel like if my theory is dead, might as well I found it, okay? At least I say I found it's dead. So let's do it. And then lo and behold, that's what happened. Three out of four trials, the first case shift is toward that non-target bar. So this is another example where bottom-up beats the top-down and first case shift goes. Down. Turns out that you have to have the, uh, the, the, the target and distractor to be quite far, uh, further extensions is strong it is. And, uh, uh, and that's a fingerprint of V1 again, because V2, you don't have so, so many monocular cells. And that's also theoretically interesting because this shows that indeed we need to find the we need to do looking without seeing. This is almost like having an egg without chicken. You need to find these two sentences in the whole book to read before you realize that these two sentences are the most important two sentences in the book to read. So this is the example that the person looked as if it had a motor action to, to shift the gaze. But if, in the same experiment, if I ask the subject, say, tell me which, if, which bar, or if there's any bar in a different eye, they cannot tell you. So they did not know what made them look. 
And in fact, some subject with the naive ones, they didn't, they were even denied they looked. I had they have to show them their gaze passing. Oh, did I look at that way? You know, you know, because it was a very fast saccade to say, oh, you know, correct the saccade to the, uh, like that. And so that is uh, because it was so surprising, uh, multiple labs, uh, vision scientists actually went back and replicated it because, uh, you know, uh, you know, it's so surprising and so, so easy to do. If you have a back office set up, you can do it right away. And um, later on, I collaborated with Wu Li, who is, yeah, yeah. Yeah, Zhou Ping, uh, that's a great result. I wonder if I could ask a quick question about yeah. that result. Um, <clears throat> so I guess there's the possibility that um, there is no unique saliency map. There could be multiple uh, versions of it, if you like. Um, some in the early visual system, some in the late. So um, the yeah. way you expressed this result was in terms of an eye movement response. Mm -hmm. um, and I wondered if you've tried or other people have tried a similar experiment where instead of a gaze shift, you're, you asked me to report something about the shape uh, of the uh, outlier, the, the target or some feature mm -hmm. of it um, that maybe would be something computed in higher visual areas. Possible then uh, that feature and shape is seen. Here we are trying to look at attention, so gaze shift is more direct, but it's also possible because seeing needs a looking ahead of time, so therefore attentional thing can, which is like a cueing effect, you can do that. But that, that's a secondary effect. So gaze shift is first uh, first effect, but it's true one could use the secondary cueing effect to further demonstrate. Yeah, uh, uh, um, uh, we did in some other one, but not not quite in this experiment. Yeah. And later on, we, we collaborate with Wu Li uh, in Beijing. We look at monkeys and the monkey fixate, and you put, put, put these things there. Monkey's task, task is to find the unique only by immediate saccato. This bar could be here, could be there, anywhere. And then in some of the trials happen to be where you're recording. And uh, on these trials, exactly the same stimulus, you can sort these trials out into the faster and slower saccade ones. And you find that the faster saccade ones actually give initial response even higher. And of course, this is so early in the response, you know, this is visual onset time, you know, zero and time versus response. It's like a 40, 50 millisecond, and it's just not enough time for the signal to come from top down feedback from frontal or, you know, from superior clippers. And of course, saccad is much later. And of course, it's also possible that, you know, maybe we want higher more than, you know, just trickle downstream to, to superior clippers. So therefore, uh, there, uh, the, uh, it, there is also some conflicting data in some other labs, so this is something to be actually uh, uh, tested more, but uh, uh, yeah, that's uh, an evidence uh, for, but not completely uh, um, uncontroversial. And then if we think that way, that answers your question that uh, uh, James, you know, what if there are some others, V1 doing the bottom up selection alone, how about other area? And one of the things we could do is say, can you predict from V1 theory, the whole ration time distribution and can it say, uh, completely match the, uh, and with no parameters, zero parameters. So therefore you don't have any way cheating. There's no fitting. And turns out that in matches the theory, uh, experimental data. So that means no, nothing beyond V1 is needed. But again, it's uh, the nice thing about this is more more of a theoretical concept that you don't have any uh, to, uh, you know, parameter tuning. But anyway, let's just move on to the next. Otherwise, uh, you know, let's say you say, okay, let's entertain that. Okay, if V one is indeed where the attention, the next thing is more more uh, uh, new. And so let's say, okay, now we look at the looking is periphery, seeing is central. And that's, you know, people long time ago look at things like, you know, different resolutions and crowding and so on. Uh, well, no, it's more than just different resolution, it's crowding. So for instance, you fixate on this cross, in fact, resolution is enough for you to see the letter T. Yeah? Fixing on this cross, you cannot see it. So it's not a matter of resolution, there's something beyond. You feed forward flood of information, one megabytes per second, after V1, let's say half a megabyte per second or quarter megabyte per second. And then you cannot see this very well, okay? Then if you can't see, you will have to feedback and say, hey, give me more information. I can't see whether it's David or Henry or whatever. And then by then information selection should have already started so you should do that more in central vision if you don't have enough brain resources. So that's a theoretical motivation that the whole idea is flood of information comes in. Imagine that your saliency map 
has already guided your gaze to it, putting your central visual field, this thing. However, then you only send a little bit of trickling down information to V2, V3, V4, let's say, imagine, okay? Now, I don't know how to metaphorically show that, so I kind of just take some pixels away. <laughs> yeah, this is a very bad way of doing it. But never just to say that even in central vision, uh, you cannot see. So then you can say, are you sure you didn't have all the information coming down to V1 to, to V2? We know some information cut out. For instance, eye of origin information cut out. Yeah, we know it's not in V2. And some special detail come out. So therefore, definitely something is gone. And then, uh, so even in central visual field, they say, hey, what is that? Is that a red yellow flower or is that a, a, a leopard? Okay. Now, if you can't see very well, you have to go back and feedback and say, tell me, is it flower or a leopard? You would need top down knowledge knowing that leopard looks this way and flower looks that way. Then you can query by sending only one or two bits of querying information, say this or that, and then you can see better. And in the that means the query needs a knowledge of what the flower looks like and what the leopard looks like. So it should introduce some bias. And so let me show you later. And uh, this was motivated also by psychophysics thing, which I'm not going to get into detail, but uh, basically it shows that bias is more stronger in central visual field rather than peripheral visual field. However, in periphery, because you don't have feedback, you can look at this and say, what is that? Oh, that's a stick figure, right? <laughs> you, you cannot go back and query and say, is it really a stick figure or something? And so therefore in periphery, you're more likely to see illusions. Let's have some fun. You can use illusions to probe the central peripheral dichotomy. So this dichotomy is motivated by the fact that bottleneck starts from V1, okay? Because bottleneck starts from V1, you have to query and then up, you can only query you, you don't have enough resources, you can you cannot query a lot, that button is very narrow, so you query just in the attentional spotlight, which is central visual field. Do you see this illusion in the periphery? Yeah, everybody knows that, and somehow in the periphery, another example, illusion in the periphery. Yeah, the rotating snake, wherever you stare, it doesn't rotate. And if you, if you go back to our old treasure of hundreds of years of illusions, you can find lots of examples. But now we understand V1 this way and this framework, can we predict new illusions? So recently we're trying to predict new illusion. Here's an illusion I recently predicted called flip tilt illusion. So the idea is you see lots of these vertical bars formed by two dots, you know, two white dots, two black dots and so on. And I call them homo dots because they are same color, black or white, same color. Now here is lots of vertical bars formed by heterodots, so black and white dots pair up. Yes, they're all vertical. So I'm telling you, uh, I'm, I'm saying that this, yes, it looks vertical, but if you stare at this location with your uh, uh, fixation and try to look in your peripheral vision, this look like horizontal. You can say, gee, I don't think so. <laughs> I'm not convinced. And so indeed, you, it's not very convincing because you have to do 50 trials, then I can show you that's in the case. But let me show you another example where I can convince you. Here is an example. If you fixate here, you will see a ring. Yeah, this is uh, uh, like a contour integration. You can see a ring, like association field contour integration. There's no illusion here. Yeah, this is all homo dots, no illusion. This is just baseline. Now, it's because all of these along the, uh, the ring is lots of these homo pairs of dots uh, and like along the tangential. Here is another example. Somehow this ring is not so easily seen. Huh? Exactly the same picture, except for each, every second of these pairs, I put in hero dots instead. Okay, that's what happened. Every second one is otherwise, it's exactly the same. The reason you cannot see the ring so clearly is because, as I told you, they are in the peripheral visual field. If you stay here, these are in your peripheral visual field, you fixate here. And the peripheral visual field, they do not look like they are tangential, but they look like they are orthogonal to the ring. Okay? That's why you cannot see it. They say, hmm, really? Okay, shall we put it actually orthogonal to the ring? Then they should be tangential. Then you should see it more easily, right? Let's try it. Now I have the same ring, except for putting, putting these hetero pairs orthogonal. Now you fix it here. Okay, so here the ring is orthogonal, here is tangential, and you take the wave, fix it. Which, which ring is easier to see? Do you see that it's more easier to see here? 
than there. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so that indeed is the illusion. And so now we can understand how the illusion, let me tell you why this illusion explain. Imagine in B1, you have a cell that's tuned to horizontal. And this horizontal cell, you have a on field and off field. If you put a pair of dots in there, vertical, it will excite the cell. Yeah. And you can also put a pair of white dots, a pair of black dots, and will all excite the cell. Four different input stimuli, they will excite the cell. But if you put this in a vertical tune bar, it cannot excite the cell. So therefore, if you have retinal input like that and go to V1, excite the cell, V1 go up there, V1 has 100 million neurons. But imagine the bottleneck start in V1. Let's have an extreme theoretical situation. Only one V1 neuron send the information forward, no other neuron send. This is neuron, this neuron called Mary, let's say. Mary is the only neuron send information forward. Now we're sending up, they say, okay, Mary is excited. And Mary is excited by this stimulus, that stimulus, that stimulus, which one it is? The high visual rate doesn't know. Okay, make a bet. Majority vote, it will say horizontal. However, if high visual, I don't want to make a rash decision, let's go check. It could be this one, yeah? Okay, now if you top down, this is a majority vote, and top down check, say, hey, that's not right. And that checking you can do in the whole central visual field, but not in periphery. That's why, in central visual field, we don't have this illusion in peripheral visual, we do. So that's the reason. And you can say, wow, that's interesting. Actually, I was just telling you, this is called feed forward, feedback, verify, and reweight. So originally, your hypothesis is that it's possible this, it's possible that, it's possible this, it's possible that. So this have four thirds of weight, and this is only one quarter of weight. And once feedback, you reweight, if it hits that, then you won't get the illusion. But if you don't have feedback, you'll get illusion. Now, if you can do it this way, you say, hey, how about I do this kind of, you know, space time and time one is X1 and time T1 and time two is X2, T2. This is a motion, rightward motion dot. And so this receptive field in V1, space time, tilted receptive field is preferring rightward motion. If you put this dot moving left instead of moving right, it will not excite this neuron. Yeah, everybody knows that. But if you make it black, it will excite this neuron again. What is this? Reverse five motion. We know reverse five illusion is there. And Stuart Anstis found that. And uh, it is actually also stronger in peripheral visual field. So that, again, makes sense. Now, so you can put reverse five motion. This is the analogy to the tilt in orientation. Yeah. So, you know, you put this, it does not excite this leftward motion cell but will excite the right mode motion cell. So that's reverse by motion. And I can give you a demo, but I think you, you guys are very familiar with it. So let me just jump. You can have an analogy in stereo vision. Stereo vision, you all know this is a random dot stereo where it's showing a, a disc in front of a ring. And this disc in front of a ring is made by copying, you know, same image, yeah, left and right. But then you shift the two central disc with a disparity, then you have, uh, this image, uh, the disc is in front. That's a normal kind of a traditional stereogram. Now, this stereogram is analogous to this homo dots. That means a white dot in one eye is white dot in another eye, black dot in one eye is black dot in another eye. So these are like that. Now, what is analogy to that? That would be heterodots, like that. This is called anti-correlated random dot stereogram. And so it will correspond to that. And therefore, it should give you reverse depth, just like a reverse fire motion. So anything that looks in front, now it should look in back because V1 neurons are excited by it. That's indeed the case. V1 disparity, two neurons. This is a one neuron a disparity firing rate versus disparity. You see, this is a preferred disparity tuned to the near and the anti preferred to, uh, to, to the far is not preferred. Turns out that these neurons, if you show them anti correlated random null stereogram, their disparity tuning curve flip. So preferred become anti preferred. That means V1 neuron is sending the reverse depths upstairs, just like these head or pair of dots. They're sending the opposite orientation. This is the opposite depths. And it's long been known that humans cannot see depths in these kind of stereogram, even though V1 neurons fire to it. So therefore, 
you say, okay, you can say use a uh, uh, Francis Quick and Christoph Cross framework to say, hey, V1 is not consciousness, you can fire neuron, we don't see it. But in our framework, it goes like this. V1 feed forward the reverse depth forward from V1 to V2. Let's call that fake news, okay? Fake news sending forward from V1 to V2. And V2 says, or V4, maybe IT, I don't know which area, okay? It says, hmm, that looks very noisy. Let me check, okay? Let me verify. And the top down V5, I feel like if you say it's in the front, it must be this kind of disparity shift. It must be black and white. And by the way, it has to go all the way to V1 to check because only in V1, you have black and white I have origin information. In V2, V3, you don't have it, okay? And so when a checker say you are telling me fake news, veto your fake news, therefore you cannot see it. So in our framework, not because V1 is not consciousness, just because top-down feedback is vetoing this fake news. Yeah, so that's the idea. Now, if you say the top uh, top down in, input is enabling the vision not to be easily fooled. So James wants you to look into this you know, deep neural network. If they don't have top down feedback, they will be fooled. So in peripheral vision, we don't have top down feedback, you will be fooled. So the prediction is in peripheral vision, you can see reverse steps. So that's the prediction. So even if the one's conscious or not, the prediction is for you can see the worst death. And we tested it, and that's indeed the case. So subject task is to say whether the central disk is front or back. And fourth choice answer, if you show them in central vision, this is the accuracy. So 50-50, fourth choice in central visual field. In peripheral view, they have much worse than chance, which means they say exactly the opposite. Okay, that's, that's very significant. And the same subject, if you make them look at these normal stereograms, both central peripheral vision is almost 100% correct accuracy. So this is a prediction from this new framework, and that, that, that's another illusion. This is, you can say, this, this is an illusion. And we follow up with fMRI studies, and you can find things that indeed this illusion is, you know, this fake news signal is somewhere in higher visual area and so on, and it's only in peripheral stronger, central weaker, and so on and so forth. That's still in study. We haven't quite completely finished it. But let's now come back to central vision because top-down feedback is very interesting. You know? Can we look at not just illusions where in peripheral you don't have feedback, and let's look at the central vision. The central vision, now let's again make it schematic. You know, this is a homo pairs of dots for the central disk. Surrounding the ring, let's just say uh, zero disparity. They are just reference, okay? So these homo pairs are with this disparity to the right. So from right eye dot to the right, left eye dot. So this disparity is positive, means this disk is in front. For these kind of empty correlated contrast reversed random dot scale where it's also pairs of dots, but hetero pairs of dots. Same disparity, but it should, V1 should be sending the signal as if it's the reverse depth, okay? And it's like that. Now, we put it this way. Imagine that you're making a new kind of stereogram. We are taking some of it from the homo pairs, some of it from the hetero pairs. Now remember, this is reverse depth. So therefore, good depth signal polluted by bad depth signal. Three pairs say in front and one pair says in the back. Okay, you are conflicting information. Okay, so therefore we call it incongruent random dot stereogram because the information from the homo pair and hetero pairs are conflict incongruent with each other. But you can also do something else where you copy but flipped this hetero pair the other disparity. Now this is exciting V1 neuron same way as other pairs. So now you are having congruent information sending forward. So we call it congruent random dot stereogram. And you can also have the neutral ones. You only have the homo pairs and no hetero pairs. Okay, I could call it neutral. And we know that these kind of depths is not visible in central vision, yeah? Because, you know, it's vetoed by top-down feedback. However, this one, of course, is normal. It's not vetoed, so you can see it. But if you're adding some noise, you'll see it less. Adding more noise, you'll see even less. So as the signal to noise get weaker, weaker, you'll see more and more difficult, yeah? So the question is, if it's congruent, would it make you easier to see it? If it's incongruent, okay, 
would it make you more difficult to see it? So even though these heteropairs are invisible to your central visual field, when it's mixed as a hybrid, could it impact your perception? That's our question. And could it give an answer about the top-down feedback mechanism? That's what I'm trying to ask. And so therefore you can just say, okay, ask people how clear can you see depths? And if there's no effect of these heteropairs because of top-down feedback, then they will have the same effect. The, the clarity of depths independent for whether it's incongruent, neutral, or congruent. However, if somehow this, you know, V1 is sending more feed-forward signal, you know, heteropairs and homopairs sending the same feed-forward signal, then you should see better in this case and see worse in that case. So that's something that we like to explore with this framework. And this is what we're trying to measure in experiment one, we ask people which one appear clear, okay? So if it's no depth, we measure something of preference. Basically just measure the percent of time they see the expected, you know, more congruent ones versus less congruent one. If that percent of time is more than 50%, we call it preference. So if no effect, they're all 50%, and uh, if it's, it's, a, it's a pro effect or, or anti effect, that pro effect is where you're comparing congruent with neutral, uh, neutral with uh, uh, random diagram, and anti effect is where you can compare neutral versus incongruent. Each time you're measuring preference for the more congruent random diagram in a pair. Yeah. So if it's more congruent, the more congruent is the neutral one. Here, the more congruent is the is the congruent one. Here is a more congruent, still congruent one. So in either way, if pro effect, this should be larger than zero, anti effect, this should be larger than zero. But if you compare the congruent with the incongruent one, then either effect there will make this larger than zero. So now let's measure it and we measure it. And if you let people view it for a very short time, on the 0.02 second, why do I choose that? Because I want it so short that you don't have time for feedback, okay? Now you find that indeed, Pro effect significant, anti effect significant, and adding together, of course, it's even more significant. Very good. Now let's give more time for feedback to start to happen. We make people look at for 0 0.1 second. Hmm, still there, still significant, significant. This somehow start to drop hmm? less. How about 0 0.2 second? Still there. This start to go away. This is still there, of course, because this is there, either one of there, it will be there, yeah? One second, this is still there, this goes over. Okay, so if we look at this anti-effect, anti-effect, the damaging effect from these heteropests are vetoed by top-down feedback. When you give enough time for top-down feedback to take effect, because you have to feed forward, takes time to feedback, yeah? However, pro effect, it doesn't. There's a bias, yeah? It's not treating equal opportunity. If you are good, I favor you. Feedback still keep you. If you're bad, you know, it's not equal opportunity. So it's, it's like the pro effect with feedback, it still keeps it. So this demonstrate top-down feedback is very interesting. You can call that non-linear constructiveness of the analysis by synthesis, because the feedback is trying to analyze, oh, is it leopard or the flower? Remember, it's trying to say, well, if it's found, it should be this way and that way, you know, then even though you have some error, well, you know, error, I can just correct your error, okay? This is like a filling in, yeah, you know, is it really a triangle? Yeah, it's actually, this is error, there's nothing there, but somehow you're constructively trying to overcome this small error when there's some hint for you to say that's correct. So you will see a triangle, even though it's not quite there. And so you will use these header pairs to help you to see depths. That makes sense? And so you see this very interesting, uh, uh, you know, top-down feedback. You can use this psychophysics, almost like a surgery tool to, to tease it apart. And this helps when we have a theoretical prediction that you can explore and try to test it. And in this case, we actually don't have a prediction. All we have is, what is top-down feedback doing? So it's actually exploration, let's see, okay? And only after we see it, we say, gee, that doesn't make sense. It looks like it's a filling in, completion, whatever you want to call it. And I, even though it's fake news sending forward, and when the fake news is helping my real news, I use it. When the fake news is not helping my real news, I veto it. 
So if you don't give me enough time for feedback, okay, fee for our wings, that's like a peripheral fish, yeah? And so anyway, I uh, this is like almost one hour. And so, yeah, so I like to just introduce kind of a new framework in the sense that asking a different kind of question from a traditional framework, which has been very successful, but nevertheless, it's kind of making progress in a different manner, such that Hugo Weasel kind of criticizes for not as making a fast progress. By asking different questions, we really expose to ourselves a lot of ignorance things about, you know, exactly what is top down feedback, exactly what V2 does. Now, what about restricted field? Do we still want to ask restricted field? Maybe yes, maybe no. I don't know whether restricted field is still the right question to ask. And so this is just the first attempt to ask questions. Central peripheral dichotomy, feed forward, feedback. And um, the most important thing is once you give predictions, they can be falsifiable. So you put yourself on the spot. So we don't want to wait another 50 years before we find out that, yes, we haven't made as much progress. So hopefully this is a stepping stone for something better. People can say this makes sense, but that doesn't make sense. Let's modify it, change it, falsify it, replace it by something better or, or something like that. Yeah. So thank you very much. Thank you. Wow, that was great, Xiao Ping. Um, I'm looking for my, here's my applause. A um, <laughs> uh, lot of food for thought uh, in that talk, it covered a lot of ground. Um, so uh, we have lots of time for questions. Um, and if you want to raise your blue hand, uh, then I can try to uh, moderate. Uh, the first blue hand I saw there uh, was uh, Jeff Schall's uh, hand, so to go. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. It was very interesting. I have two things, if it's okay. The first one, a um, little tongue in cheek. So the elephant in the room was selection and you filled the selection box with the elephant. Does that mean that we never forget what we select? <laughs> Uh, what's yellow? Uh, I didn't quite get the sentence. What, what yellow? Uh, what did you say? Uh, the first the sentence. Elephant was... was in the selection box. Oh, elephant was in the selection. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So we should never forget what we selected. I'm not sure whether we never forget. Didn't yeah. Jeremy Wolf say the visual search has no memory? Maybe we do forget. Yeah. I, I, I think Dr. Shaw is making a, a joke. Okay, okay. I need to get some better sense of humor. Okay, yeah. The, the more serious question is the, the, the evidence was, was clear and compelling in the context of really dense displays. Mm -hmm. In our world, the displays are not that dense. And so I just wanted to invite you to talk about like eight circles, one of them's green. And so they're so far apart, they're outside the surround of a V1 receptive field. Yes, yes. Where so I think fit? you're right. V1 can only do the bottom up very quick selection, a dense array with everything uniform except for one. Maybe that's the case. So when things get difficult, I think top down really need to come in. So maybe the, uh, 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 so this is why I feel that maybe superior clickers is like a committee chair who is listening to the V1 selection when V1 is impulsive and stupid and fast, but cannot think very wise. And the top down when things are sparse and then, then the, uh, uh, you know, and the V2, V3, frontal, because the superior clickers actually receive lots of input from frontal, parietal. Uh, however, V1, at least to the superficial layers of superior clickers, V1 is dominant. More than 50% of input to superficial is actually from V1. So anatomically it's there. And so therefore it's a question. You can also say, look, if a bottom-up selection is very brief, okay, it's very transient. That has been known since in psychology, for instance, Nakayama, uh, Macabon, and you know, Homer Miller and so, and they're very transient. So if I look at this, uh, this image for 10 seconds, so my only probably one saccade is contributed by V1, okay? By the time the second saccade, the transientness goes away and sustained selection long time. So therefore you can say V1 plays a very little role, you know, 10 seconds is first a card, 10 seconds with 30 cards, yeah? And that's indeed true for lots of people's work, you know, like uh, uh, Mick Dunk and uh, Dunk Mick or Mick Dunk, Mick Dunk, yeah. <laughs> you know, Yang, Yang Lewis, and it's very transient. So in this sense, you can say V1 is trivial. However, we can also think another way. You can say the universe, the first second of the universe determine the rest of the history. 
So in that sense, the V1 is dominant. Now imagine I walk into the room, my husband is to the left, I never met him, I pop out, I first select him, my rest of history is this way. Okay, <laughs> you know, or versus I turn to the right to meet my supervisor, and then, you know, I do something else. So, but these are all theoretical speculations. We can probably uh, experimentally probe to show, you know, time-wise, V1 is unimportant, but maybe if, if vision is an iterative framework, you know, you first select, then you look, and the look makes you select again, and that kind of a butterfly effect to completely blow up, or not a butterfly effect such that V1 is not so significant. I do not have a clear answer, but I'd love to hear what you think, yeah, yeah. Okay, um, there are lots of blue hands happening now, and uh, but I think Jeremy actually Jeremy had his real hand up for a while. Yeah, yeah, Jeremy. Really a nice vintage uh, spirit there, yeah. but uh, he's yeah I think he's next on the list. A, a, a couple of things. Your mm -hmm. um, central peripheral thing makes mm -hmm. it sound like um, uh, that when you select something it's to put it, you, that you have to put it in the fovea in order to find it. And that's clearly not, um, not correct. This is actually sort of a version of Jeff's uh, question. If, if I have stimuli that are not constrained by crowding and acuity, um, mm -hmm. I can uh, direct my attention to them. I can search for them efficiently in the periphery without any difficulty mm -hmm. along the same lines I, I think a lot of the things that you're doing where you're saying, oh, look, this only happens in the periphery would move more centrally if you simply scaled your image down, right? That, that if, you, if you use yeah. smaller stimuli, you'd find that, um, uh, that, that the same effects were, um, were occurring centrally. I mean, that's certainly been the story um, in the crowding literature, for instance. That, that it's not that the, just the periphery is crowded, it's the periphery, the, 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 the center is crowded if you make the things small enough to crowd them. In, yes, in the you're right. So in this framework, a lot of things exactly, what is central, what is periphery is not defined. And so I kind of, this is a very, uh, you know, it's sometimes you, you kind of put in almost a dichotomy, but really, I don't know, you know, this is more like a caricature because I, I want to first of all make it like a little bit of a caricature to be to be refined. So for instance, I, I, in, in the work, if I show motion, I realize that the central is bigger. But if I show orientation feature, the central is smaller. Okay, so for instance, in this uh, peripheral stereo vision, it turns out, okay, you know, five degrees, five degrees is peripheral enough. In motion, you've got to be a bit more uh, in, the, in the, uh, the orientation less. I don't know where it's periphery. Recently, we're looking at this uh, backward masking. Backward masking, in fact, we're trying to look at the top down feedback. And you can predict that backward masking is weaker in the peripheral visual field because backward masking is like top down feedback. And turns out that at least our preliminary data, that three degrees is peripheral enough. Three degree and one degree, huge difference. So therefore, I don't know where it's peripheral. So this is an empirical question. And uh, you know, if you look at the, this, this, the you know the, the density of of, of cones, and uh, there isn't a sharp boundary. I don't know. Yeah. So you're right. I don't know where it's peripheral. Okay. Um, just before the next question, uh, Lori had to leave, um, and I'll just. Um, read her quote, which is excellent talk shopping. <laughs> so she can have a question, just a comment. Um, and uh, I think we have Hugh Wilson next with a question. You know, hi, hi, shopping. Uh, really enjoyed your talk, but I want to make the argument that there really can't be a dichotomy between central and peripheral. If you look at receptive fields in the retina, they grow in size in diameter, essentially linearly from the center out. The density decreases to roughly allow appropriate uh, um, overlap, et cetera, given the receptive field size. Um, and so I would suggest that if you, instead of using white and black dots, use bandpass stimuli 
dogs, difference of Gaussian circularity, which can be white center or black center. And so you can redo all your experiments. I'd predict that as you increase the spatial frequency, you'd push the periphery further away. Mm -hmm. In fact, uh, we have done something, you know, including that indeed we actually change um, uh, the stereo. We actually make a bigger dot, smaller dots, finer eccentricity, uh, a finer disparity, and not finer disparity. But uh, this is so new; it's only 2018. We haven't investigated enough eccentricity. But I think you you can try it. Perhaps you're right, and I like to re re uh, reiterate. The central peripheral dichotomy is really the two extreme, and I already said that I don't know where is the boundary. Really, it's like we need to think that from one end to another end. Perhaps that's a better way. I think uh, this is a very important feedback. It's a better way. Do not say there's two uh, thing, but it's it's you know there is a gradation, just like what's suggested by the cones densities and the rest of the field sizes. Yeah. In the end, perhaps if you look at the feedback, now I'm actually collaborating with an amateur just to look at the feedback cables. And, uh, um, you know, for instance, Jeff Shaw's work have a lot of, you know, you see the central peripheral projections quite different. And uh, is this difference uh, clear cut and not clear cut, perhaps not so clear cut, and maybe uh, and whether the central peripheral from v MT feedback to V1 versus V4 feedback to V1, perhaps that's perhaps reflecting in our data that why motion periphery is much bigger compared to, to, uh, to color and orientation. So uh, uh, that's perhaps the past dependency. But anyway, I'm just showing that to say that I don't know, a lot of questions need to be answered. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Hamid, there was- Hi, um, thank you very much for the nice talk. My question is actually if you think um, if it's possible that uh, the saliency map in V1 could um, have been at least partially in, uh, inherited from superior colliculus. And I have two reasons for that. Mm -hmm. One is that uh, surround suppression is stronger and um, happens earlier, 40, 50 milliseconds in the superior colliculus than V1. And the second reason is that the, the difference between um, the differential response of uh, when um, a target in the, is in the receptive field, while when it's outside in the same hemifield is also um, uh, earlier in the superior colliculus, although visual latency of V1 neurons um, are, are less than the colliculus. So given all of this together, you think there is a tight connection or um, an interaction between colliculus and V1? And we know that at least in a pre-mammalian uh, species, colliculus was very important for, for, for example, yes. for uh, catching yes, the prey. Yeah. yeah. So in fact, we are looking at fish these days. I have uh, written a, a comparative study. I think uh, superior is the saliency map in fish. There is no V1 in fish. They don't even have neocortex. And so for instance, in the mice, it could be a job share between V1 and superior And that's actually something I propose to look at. I'm collaborating with people on that. And you, you pointed out correctly that superior colliculus in, uh, response latency is actually longer than V1. So therefore this signal difference cannot have come from inherited from superior colliculus. However, I want to point out there's uh, work from um, Doug Monas's lab. They said that superior colliculus signals signals earlier than V1. So that's what I meant. There's some conflicting data there. However, uh, they missed this peak, could be because, I don't know, because previous other people also found this peak when they were not looking at saliency. They were having fixating in your, uh, monkeys, okay? So therefore we are not the only, except we look at specific for saliency with behaving monkeys. And so therefore the, the, the things are open. How can you explain 40 millisecond things? Yes, you're right. V1 and superiorclips could interact. For instance, superiorclips does not project to V1. V1 projects to superiorclips. Superiorclips go go to LGN, which then go further to V1. We also have evidence of branch side. You can say people with branch side with V1 lesions, they can still orient where they come from. In fact, I think there's a collaboration between Iti, Laurent Iti and uh, uh, Yoshita. So they, they lesion monkeys and monkey can still do saccade. In fact, that was a VSS talk. And afterwards I congratulated this author. I said, gee, you just killed the V1 theory. Congratulations. He said, no, I haven't killed it. I haven't told you detail. 
So what is the detail? I said the monkey right after religion cannot do sakat for two weeks, but uh, two months, whole two months. However, if you lesion frontal eye field, Jeff Shaw, you can probably tell more, you know, right after anesthesia wears off, monkey do sakat, no problem. Yeah. So the poor monkey cannot even barely fixate right after the, you know, then slowly learn. And, uh, and then after two months, then monkey start to do sakat. All these blind side human patients usually are checked after six months. And so therefore, and there's also uh, work by let's say um, the David Leopold's lab, they talk about the possibility that LGN involvement perhaps coming from the K pathway from superfix to LGN to MT or extra cortex that could be the, 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 the neural basis from blind side, but this is just one literature. It is possible that after lesion V1, your ancient evolutionary ancient pathway from, from uh, uh, the retina to secret clicks, they have to be woken up in you know, all the neural degenerations. Two months is maybe enough to regrow something to some degree. However, it is known, uh, no, it is known from this data, it seems like at least in normal humans, secret clickers cannot uh, serve for saccade. And in, in primates, there's only less than 10% of retinal neurons project to superior clickers, while almost 100% project to LGN. So there's an evolutionary trend. So for instance, in, in, um, uh, in, in mice, you know, almost up to 100%, maybe from 70% to 100% of uh, retinal neurons project to superior clickers. In monkeys, less than 10%. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, I think Sam, uh, you've been waiting to ask a question for a while. Well, uh, thanks. Uh, so, hi. Uh, so, so I think this is just a clarificatory question, um, but maybe it's a worry. I don't really know. So, I mean, um, it, it, it's, it's certainly true that there's a lot of these kind of impressive cases of change blindness and so forth that suggest that, um, you know, we don't perceive as much as we naively take ourselves to. But I guess I wondered uh, what you think of some seemingly impressive cases of inattentive vision. Um, so, so one study I was kind of thinking of, um, which I think would kind of maybe help me understand the proposal better was this study by Fei Fei Li that I think she did in collaboration with Christoph Koch back in 2002 or something like that. And basically subjects were given an intentionally demanding task in central vision, um, you know, which they were also deploying focal intention to. So they had to determine whether five letters at different orientations were all the same letter or there was another one out. Um, and while this happened, um, an image that was masked was presented in the periphery at some random location. And the finding was that subjects, whilst they supposedly didn't have enough time to deploy attention to that peripheral uh, image, which is only presented for 27 milliseconds or something, um, they, they were able to categorize it. So I guess I was wondering what's going on there on your view. Like, is this a case where there's actually just enough information getting through from the initial encoding stage? Um, you know, it might be diffuse or sparse in some way, but it's just enough to do the categorization later on. Or is it that this is a case where there's, um, you know, there's some kind of peripheral querying <laughs> going on um, from the selection stage? And how would we tell between those two? So again, this point out to the weakness of talking about only central or only peripheral, I kind of capture it. So from this diagram, you can say peripheral, there's still some feed forward, even though you can say attentional spotlight is here, the spotlight it doesn't have a sharp boundary. So if your task in the periphery, even though they're sparse, you can still do it. Um, so we know deep neural network can do it. We know that periphery is subject to illusions. Deep neural network are these feed forward networks. They can do superhuman performance of object recognition. So therefore without feedback, you can do very well. But deep neural network also have illusions. They call it adversarial attack. Yeah, they are vulnerable to adversarial attack. And they call that because they say, okay, they don't have visual understanding. Now, what do you mean by visual understanding? Top-down feedback requires visual understanding. Top-down feedback say, is it a flower or is it, uh, is it, um, yeah, yeah. So this is, 
you know, it's like only if I understand what flower look like and what uh, what a leopard look like, you can do have top down feedback. And so this is, you know, I, I'm linking, making a link about that. So just because you have only feed forward doesn't mean you cannot perform well. Just like a neural network is already giving us the existence proof that you could do that. Yeah. This, this so is right. I mean, if, if, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. I, I, I mean, I was just gonna maybe ask, um, you know, without kind of spelling out these distinctions, it, I mean, would it be completely unfair to say that it's like not really a falsifiable um, model at the moment? It's like, a, you know, it's an interesting possibility to be spelled yeah, so out. So this is falsifiable. So today I try to make lots of predictions. These are all falsifiable. Sure, okay, yeah, that's right. Today we haven't falsified them, but maybe there's another experiment. This, for instance, I'm predicting, and we, we just did it our own empirical uh, observations here. And th this this is a predicted thing, and also including the, I mean, this prediction is actually quite bold, yeah? I'm predicting that you can see peripheral things. Knowing very well, nobody can see that in central vision. That is actually quite, falsifiable yeah the fact yeah that sorry that's, that's, fair. <laughs> that's the idea that we can falsify them and of course when we study this this is not a prediction this is only exploration so we cannot say we falsified them so so i i feel like with theoretical thing i want to emphasize that we can oh sorry oh i, I should not have done that i just did a, a stop sharing where that's not what i wanted to do and so uh, i i actually want to say uh, uh, that I, I want to make sure that oops, sorry, I said that, that this is, oh, anyway, I, I want to say that this is falsifiable, that, that we want to make predictions and then theoretical com combining theory. So for instance, when today, when I make things like, you know, ocular singleton should pop out. Remember, I almost kind of uh, crashed with my own prediction. I said, this prediction is not possible. And that, and also the prediction without any uh, uh, free parameters to tune, yeah? So for instance, when we say that, uh, am I still sharing screen or not? I, I think it's just taken it away. <laughs> you start oh, sharing it, I, see, I, think, yeah. I see. Uh, Oh, I see. So, so when I make the prediction, this is, the, this is something when my theoretical physicists Friends always say, you neuroscience, you know, you're all very wishy-washy or thing. When can you predict something that's actually without fitting? This is something we predicted without fitting, okay? Reaction time distribution without a single parameter. This is very, very falsifiable. It's like we say tomorrow afternoon, exactly two o'clock, uh, uh, Toronto is gonna rain. And then tomorrow you see afternoon whether it'll rain or not. Yeah, and you really put yourself on the spot. There's no fitting. You cannot say, oh, it doesn't rain. Let me change the fitting parameter alpha becomes something and it's three o'clock rather than two o'clock. There's no way you already said it. And so therefore, but that's, you, that, that, that is the, uh, something like, uh, uh, you know, to, to protect us theorists because we theorists often dream things that's not falsifiable. And that's why I love doing experiments because that can keep me on the ground because otherwise I just get, you know, I can I, I don't know. Yeah, well, you know, then you get carried away. Yeah. That's super interesting, thanks. Thank you, thank you. Yeah. Okay, um, I think Kevin has a question. Yeah, I guess this is sort Hi, of- Hi, Kevin. Hi, really interesting. I think this is, follow up to it, it sounds like a number of the comments are in sort of this peripheral central dichotomy or this dichotomy between looking and seeing and you're sort of saying well you know it's it's a gradient thing and maybe maybe the way to think about it is that there are these two function in vision and there's a kind of trade-off between them so some sometimes you'll find more seeing and less looking and sometimes to get more looking you have to give up the seeing um, but it's going to be gradient That's right. and, and then in these uh, yeah. these sort of predictions that you're making rely on uh, finding the sort of extreme cases. So you don't really have to um, parameterize how much looking and how much seeing is happening. But as you get to those more borderline yeah. cases, it seems like 
you know, not viable, but there is still, there's still this parameter that you are going to have to um, start modeling, which is how much looking, how much seeing in these, given the sort of information available, given uh, where and center, where in the retina it's happening. You're That's right. So the condition is very, very extreme. Okay, you can say, okay, this never happens in natural C. Okay. And that, that's the theoretical approach where you say, I, only this can be falsifiable. It's so precise, you can't cheat. Because if it's in the middle, you can always tune some free parameters. Right. Okay. But, but as when you go to the middle, you have to introduce that, right? Yeah. Say it again. As you go to that sort of uh, borderline region, I mean, you yeah. would have to introduce a parameter. Uh, that's right. And then it's no longer, that means in such borderline region, it's not falsifiable. Right. And same thing, you cannot falsify Newton's law. Let's say Newton's law of gravity. How did he test it? He tested an extreme case in extra collateral space right. with moon and sun. He doesn't test with a gun shooting, you know, to the atmosphere and drop. Because why? There's lots of free parameters. The frictions of the air, what is the turbulence and all this. You cannot test this law on Earth. You have tested a non-natural situation of the moon and the sun, and, you know, when the planet goes so far away. And one of his predictions is such that, you know, the planet for one particular, not one particular, you know, called planet, yeah, moving is not as predicted by, him, by the Newton's law. Then that means his law is false. But remember, the prediction is like you assume there's a sun, and then there's a, there's, a, there's a earth and the earth is moving around sun by his ellipse, it's Kepler's law, okay, exactly like that. But that assumes that the other planets are far away. Does that make sense? So, but if the other planets are away, they're Kentucky. So one case they did not predict and predict it's, it's a trajectory is different from the, and then you say the law is falsified. But then another theory said, no, that means there's another planet also. Okay, that's a theoretical prediction. If Newton's law is correct, there's another planet down there, it's tucking it. And so this theorist then go to some experiment and say, say, tomorrow, could you please point your telescope at seven o'clock? I don't know, this is made up. I don't know what it's seven o'clock, okay? The exact time, exact angle, and this angle, you will see a planet. And so, so, it. so, I mean, I yeah, yeah. So I, I sort of love that discussion, that that sort of point that you you need you can get quite a lot out of quite extreme cases. But you would still think yeah, that right. in the Newton case, um, there there's some level of if we knew what these other forces were, the force of friction and wind force and thing, we would be okay. able to predict these things. And so I guess okay. you, it's not that it's unfalsifiable; it's that if you had more information, you would be able to localize the parameter. Exactly. So therefore, in the future, I don't know when in the future, I guess I'm long dead. If this V1 theory did not quite die, we should get it more and more difficult prediction. Let's say, you know, we know the frictions and wind and whatever, you know, get to predict in a natural state and, and things like that. But the thing is most important and we have to predict in a way we don't have free parameter to tune because otherwise it is not fair, it's not possible. Yeah, Ping, I realize I've, I've, I'm, I'm not quite sure what the prediction is on this slide. Uh -huh. what, what, this what's, the, what's the zero parameter prediction? Uh, 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 not no, this no, one. This with, is with the, the, with the reaction time thing. Yeah, okay. So this the prediction is, is, is that, okay. It says that, uh, um, that they say V1, and it says the highest firing neuron should, um, uh, should fire and get this reaction time, and, and, and there's no parameters. Uh, this is a whole curve without parameters. They say, how did you do that? Okay, yeah, again, you're, you're just, it's, it's the curve, not the absolute RT that you're predicting, right? I am predicting absolute RT. That's in, impossible. Let me show you how I do it. Uh, this, is, uh, this is such a lucky thing that I actually hit it and then give me a chance to, to, to test it. Let me show you how I do it. So imagine that you have a particular RT. Now remember, just go, okay. Okay, this way. So imagine that you have a color pop out. Okay, there's a red among blue, and uh, okay, you measure RT V1 response. Of course, some V1 you are tuned to colors, other V1 you are tuned to orientation, and so on. And there's a color tuned neuron that responding very highly. Okay, that's the case because 
it's iso color suppression is not there. All the orientation two neurons are suppressing each other. So imagine that, so for instance, this bar is exciting two neurons, one tuned to its orientation, one tuned to its blue color. And this bar is exciting two neurons, one tuned to the orientation, orientation is suppressed by other orientation, one tuned to red color, and this net red color is not suppressed by other red. Does that make sense? Yeah, okay. And then you measure ration time. Imagine that ration time in the chart is 500 milliseconds. I said, ha, huh, where does that ration time come from? According to the V1 theory, there is a color tuned cell. It's spiking, I'm just giving an example, 10 spikes per second. Let's say it's spiking X spikes per second, okay? Now, superior clicus, your muscle and all the calibration has already worked out that this spiking means 500 milliseconds. And this curve is monotonic. That means the higher spiking, less ration time. Okay, that's more or less uh, what it is. So far, I haven't predicted anything. Now, imagine I have another orientation. Sorry, this is a blue bar, okay, not, not red. Blue bar, okay, this is a mistake. And it's 600 milliseconds. So C for orientation pop out, O for orientation pop out. And let's say you measure ration time 600 milliseconds. And that's obviously because a neuron tuned to this orientation is escaping like to like suppression, okay? Now, if it's 600 milliseconds, then it's firing must be less than that firing, correct? Because this monotonic curve. Uh, can you see my cursor? Because of monotonic curve. So if it's 600 milliseconds, that means longer reaction time, it must be because firing is smaller. Is that correct? Okay, does that make sense? Yes, cool. Because, yeah, so far, so good. Okay, no prediction yet. Now let's predict. Imagine you have this bar that pop up not only because it's red, but also because of orientation. So it's a double feature pop up, redundant feature pop up. Okay, let's predict what's its reaction time 500, 600, or 400. Can you predict? Well, not, not... if V1 only has neuron tuning. And orientation, yeah. Imagine it's a coin model. V1 has only color and orientation. Now, one neuron fires X amount of spike. The other neuron fires Y's amount of spike. Uh, 10 and 9 is this example, doesn't it? Okay. These two neurons are highest firing. Who's firing, firing more? Obviously, the color neuron is firing more. The color neuron firing that much spike close to 500. So you predict 500. Exact. No parameter tuning. Does that make sense? I haven't given any parameters. You experimentally measured 500 here, experiment measured 600 here, and I predict this will be 500. This is the prediction. If V1 does not have any neuron tuned to more than color and orientation. Now you say, look, you know, it's not just 500. You can collect many tries, okay? Sometimes 500, sometimes 600 is a huge distribution because V1 neuron sometimes 10 spikes, 9 spikes, 11 spikes. So it's a huge distribution. Same thing here. It's a huge distribution. It must have lots of different firing stochastic, huge distribution. Now from these two curves, using this equation, this is a race model equation, you can predict exactly what that curve is, zero parameter. Well, how you do, you randomly select an IT, random sample from here, random sample IT from here, take that minimum and put it here. Repeat. I think we're not quite seeing the here that you're talking about, but, but yeah. I, the, oh, yeah, should I slow down so that? No, 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 no. You, you, you just yeah, so therefore this whole curve is. But, um, yeah, Xiaoping, it's not your fault. And, and it's just, that it's just there's there's a delay yeah. uh, in where your cursor oh. is, what you're presenting, relative to your voice. Your oh. your words are coming ahead. <laughs> uh, oh, uh, I see. I'm sorry. So this delay only just happened right now. Maybe uh, I'm sorry. Yeah, I hope it wasn't fine. there in the earlier. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm, and so that you can predict, and therefore this is how we predicted. I predicted. Uh, you know, turns out that this prediction is wrong because we use a V1 toy model where V1 doesn't have neuron tuned conjunctively to orientation and color. 
for V1 actually has. Then we find an extreme case when V1 doesn't have a neuron tuned to orientation color, and then we just do that and then exactly predict that's how we know this is how we have orientation color and motion. Only in orientation color motion, that's a non spurious prediction. That's exactly, we can use p value to find that the predicted and measured reaction time is larger than p value 0 0.05. And that's repeated for six subjects. So it's as if repeated six different monkeys because each subject have a different exchange rate from firing rate to reaction time. Some subjects are more athletic, other subjects are so forth. Each subject reaction time in six reaction time tasks to predict the seventh reaction time task, no single parameter. And that is the most falsifiable neuroscience prediction I myself have experienced because there is, it's not predicting one number, it's predicting a whole curve without a single parameter. And uh, that I then go back to my theoretical physics friends. I say, well, neuroscience is upcoming. We cannot do it because in theoretical physics, they have these, you know, beautiful curves and it, it's just predicted and uh, agreeing with data. And we, our, our accuracy is much, much worse than physics accuracy. But within the amount of data you, you collect, p values larger than 0.0. That's, that's what I mean by very falsifiable prediction from theory, and we can test it. Okay, I, um, okay, bye, Jeremy. So, uh, thank you, Jeremy. A lot of great questions and, um, and interesting results. I, I, I'm motivated now to read that last paper. That sounds really interesting. Um, so, I, I just wanted to make sure that there were a bunch of people that had to leave and they, um, made some comments and in case you didn't see them, Xiaoping oh, must comments. go, great talk. Peter Kohler Thank says, you. brilliant talk. And we have nice talks and uh, yeah. So a lot of uh, obviously uh, uh, made a uh, very strong uh, impact on, on the York Vision community. So thank you so much. Xiao Thank Ping, you very much. Office of Energy. For inviting me. I really appreciate all the feedbacks uh, and the discussion. Thank you very much. Yeah, and, and thank you for uh, spending your Friday night, you know, when you normally be out at the disco. And uh, here you are. Oh, with I, I really appreciate your inviting because this is the York University Center for Visual Research. This is, you know, there's no better place for you to spend a Friday night. I really appreciate your invitation and have all these. Uh, feedbacks and discussions, and uh, especially the criticism regarding the non dichotomy between central peripheral, it really is a continuum. And I, as I found, point out, this is still new. I would like to see it, you know, falsified, tested, and um, uh, abandoned if it's wrong, and uh, revised if it's only half wrong or something like that. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, I'm sure this is an ongoing conversation. So. Anyway, thank, thanks once again, and look forward to seeing you at the next uh, Vision meeting. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.